So thank you, Jody, for coming in. And I haven't said that before. Now I'm saying it. So it's not like the scripted part, which I do, of course, don't like on my shows. So thank you very much, Jody. And of course, we'll ask you to tell us about yourself and then you can take it from there. The session is yours. I come in when you want me to come in. So please. Well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity for really um, working internationally to be building our network and our community of peace builders and, and people who work together to resolve conflict. You know, it's wonderful to have somebody who is so focused and tuned on building the community. So I want to say thank you for this opportunity and thank you for creating the space for the conversation. It's in incredibly important. It's always nice to be appreciated. And it's, it's really actually so, it's so nice to connect with wonderful people all over the world that it's just enjoyable. I mean, just those conversations are so enjoyable. And of course, you learn mm. also about what's happening, but it's been really nice. So thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I, I find what's so amazing about these networks is you can live in very different parts of the world, but there's a commonality of themes and interests and values and, and things that people are committed to and you kind of meet somebody from a totally different world and you suddenly discover just how much commonality there is across those worlds. And yeah. it's very reassuring, actually, um, and, I, and I, I really like that. So, you know, because, I find this really helpful. Well, actually, that's the thing that I really like is that if you can if you can connect to that one basic which is that common part or whatever in terms of our thought process in terms of a value system about anything when I mean, you connect there it doesn't really matter where the person comes from so you connect no. at that point which just actually goes beyond everything else and i mean these conversations that i have on these shows that i have i have never met those people they walk in like you've walked in i mean i've never met you but no. it just doesn't seem like that to me. And just there is something that you connect to in a person. And that's what I really like doing. And that's really something which I've enjoyed doing. Yeah, please. Mm. Yep, absolutely. And thank you. And I'm based in Australia. And um, we have had a very interesting time over the last two to three years being locked down um, and, and isolated and, and kind of removed to dealing with COVID um, and COVID has opened up some wonderful opportunities in terms of working on Zoom and connecting with people. It has also generated some really complex ways of needing to be very nimble and agile to, to work with the people that we want to work with. And I work mainly in um, family law and separation, but I also work in restorative justice. So people who have experienced harm in, in institutions and helping them to um, repair some of that harm and, and recover and move forward. So um, I, I do a lot of that work. It's, it's very nourishing. The mediation and the restorative engagement kind of really inform each other and come from a very similar foundation for me. Um, it might be helpful if I just kind of explained where mediation sits in Australia in the family law system. In 1975, we introduced a no-fault divorce system, which also prioritised children. And I heard you speaking in the last session about how important children were and building scaffolding around them. And when you look about spirituality and heart and soul, the heart and soul of our world is our children. Um, and, and there can be nothing more powerful and, and more primal than kind of working for them and supporting parents to actually manage their world and manage the changes in their world. So, you know, for me, it's a really lovely starting point. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. And, 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 and yeah, and it's yours. I mean, I won't even come in. I'm telling you, I, I'll just let you speak. <laughs> That's, I'll come in whenever you want, but like I said, please. Yeah. Um, it, it may be helpful given the, the topic for me to kind of talk a little bit about my background and what informs why I do what I do and why I find it meaningful. Um, I've heard you kind of touch on it a little bit earlier, but I really want to highlight that for me, I hold a, a really strong sense of hope and optimism. 
So I recognise that I probably see people in a really tough time in their lives and that people people want to do better and they want to make some really good decisions, but sometimes their circumstances are such that they're not always able to, to present their best, their best selves. I'm very lucky. I come from a background in social work. And what that means is that I started off working with people who lived on the street and were homeless. So what I learned very quickly was um, these ideas around unconditional positive regard for people. So that Carl Rogers concept of being with people, walking with people, and, and just being there, bearing witness to their lives and, and being open to them. Um, and also that notion of being kind, listening, being attuned, paying attention. And a very powerful gift I think we can give people is to be present and attuned and listen and hear. And from there, hopefully they can move forward. I, I see our process as mediation, whether it's relationships or um, workplace or community or business, as ostensibly about relationships um, and creating that space where we can help people to hear each other in a way maybe they either haven't been heard before or, or they're not hearing the other person can create really powerful shifts. And if we are demonstrating that respectful, trustworthy behaviour and that unconditional positive regard, then it's almost, I don't want to say it's viral, but it actually teaches people the true power of being and feeling heard. And then they want to do that for somebody else because they can feel the ripple effect and the impact and how that resonates. So in terms of, you know, I guess I'm thinking about heart and soul as a process, but also as a mediator, kind of walking that walk and talking the talk around creating a space where people can be heard, they can be validated, they can be acknowledged, they can hear each other in a way that maybe they haven't heard before, they can identify that there might be points of difference but that doesn't mean that they have to fight it doesn't mean that they can't find a pathway forward from there means kind of creating a general shift at a very micro level but it can lead hopefully to bigger shifts in a macro level because I, I truly believe that you can create a ripple impact by by kind of changing one person's life and then they then use those skills and lessons that they learn to have an impact on other people that they come across. Um, and hopefully that kind of has a big impact on, 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 you know, children in their lives. And, you know, we're teaching people to, in a way, to actually engage with, with each other better um, and mm -hmm. be heard and hear better, if that makes sense. Absolutely, I think, I think, and I basically, of course, I know I'm not going to come in. Otherwise, I'll just take away from what you were saying. No, but... it's all right. It's all, you're not going to take over. I'm happy for you to kind of talk to me about it. That you know, the whole emphasis of what I'm saying, Vikram, is that it's about engagement. It's about connecting with people, and people don't need a talking head or somebody to preach to them they actually need to see about that connection and that engagement, that attunement, which doesn't happen if I sit here and talk at you. So I, I'm, I'm happy for you to kind of talk to me and with me. Um, no, because I, when you said that ripple effect, so that is where the aspect of heart, soul and spirituality from the perspective of the mediator. So that aspect being attuned with your own self or those aspects of yourself, and then that first ripple effect to go out to a party and then further going into the whole process. So I think that's important, that ripple starting from the self. From self. And you're, you're, you're also talking about, and I, I would probably have a slightly different framework, which is around developing insight and using self-reflection and using um, reflective practice to actually think about why am I doing what I'm doing and how am I doing it? And really being open to what that looks like and what that experience is. 
Um, and, you know, that can be the good, bad and the ugly because we don't get everything right all the time and we need to, you know, look for those teachable moments where we can improve our practice and maybe look at, hang on, I'm not getting this right and, and give the clients that we come across permission to actually tell us whether we've got it right. So to work with them rather than, you know, oh, I'm the expert, I'm going to tell you what's what. And, and, and I... You know, when we're talking about that, um, I think it's very dismissive and diminishing for clients to be told that they've got the expert who's going to make all the decisions for them, who's going to tell them what they need to do in their lives. I would much rather walk with people, bear witness, be there, be part of the journey, rather than, you know, like I said, stand up and be, I'm the expert, I know what's what. I can talk to them about, you know, what research says. I can talk to them about what children need and I can talk to them about what children don't need. Um, but it has to be a, a strength-based invitational approach which says the client is the expert in their life. Yeah. And it's not, I'm saying it's not easy for everyone to do that, for, for a mediator to be able to merge within that whole within whoever is in, with him or with her and to be able to take that journey like you said together it's not mm. everyone can't do it and that's what i'm saying that these aspects first from the mediator's perspective to be able to connect that heart soul and mm. spirituality and then of course into the process so i think that's very important i think the journey together like you said is i think that's a very important aspect yeah look i think it's a very transformative and therapeutic lens notwithstanding I'm not offering therapy or transformation but I do think that I don't think it's very helpful particularly with the way I work and and I know other people work in different ways and I'm not dismissive of them but we're talking about what I find helpful in my practice I, I think that directive this is what you need to do um it's, it's kind of standing above a person and I, I really like walking with people um, and, and I, I think you're right, you're identifying that there are different ways of working with people and that's informed, I guess, by your value system. But my value system is not, not altruism because I think altruism, I, I have some concerns about altruism because I believe that we all have interests and needs that we meet and, and my interest and needs are met by walking with people. It's meaningful to me. It matters to me. Um, I think it's an incredible gift that clients give us. Um, their trust, it's a privilege to walk with them. I think holding on to curiosity where we inquire rather than judge or, or tell them is, is kind of, I guess that's what I would like if I was seeing a mediator, if I was entrusting somebody with supporting me or, or with my dispute to facilitate that conversation. So it's really that facilitative um, way of operating. But for that, Jodi, I think you'll also maybe have to take us a little bit into yourself. One is, of course, the practice as a mediator is yeah, one thing, but you as a person, a little bit about your journey and how you would connect these aspects within yourself. A little bit about that, if you want to. Um, well, my, I guess my, my journey was starting off in, in, as a social worker working in homelessness and, and discovering very quickly about, you know, there were many people who, who ended up where they were through trauma journeys so a lot of their responses were trauma responses but also as a consequence of traumatic experiences either that they had or that family members had had and there you know it was kind of I was curious about what why they had ended up where they had but what I discovered very quickly was there were a whole lot of circumstances that were was often out of people's control and there was an element of luck that led them to be where they were. So that began my journey of really appreciating and sitting with people and seeing the power of sitting with people and bearing witness and walking with people. And then 
when I moved into conflict resolution and I was really, I moved into conflict resolution because I discovered that in homelessness there was a lot of conflict um, and I found I didn't find conflict frightening or scary. I found conflict exciting because what was exciting was not creating a fight, but the energy. People have an energy around conflict and a keenness to, to kind of move something, to create a shift, to create a transformation and growth. And that really excited me. So I moved into, I went back to uni and did a master's in conflict resolution and I wanted to start with kind of the most fundamental um, unit that you can start with, which is families. So that was the space that I moved into. And I just found that um, there was an incredible synergy between walking with people in homelessness as a social worker and kind of being informed by this unconditional positive regard and curiosity with people and then mediation and I found that there was a real really a parallel process my social work skills around engaging and connecting with people really informed my mediation skills and I find and and Vikram I don't know whether it's the same with you but when you're in congruent with your values and what you do there's there's it's very hard to demarcate what came came first was it the value system that led me here or is it because I find this work so incredibly powerful and impactful and meaningful you know every session that I have changes me every client that I have who I'm really clear only tells me the portion of their life they tell a very carefully curated version of their life because we all want to be accepted um, so I get the tip of the iceberg. But in homelessness, I found that when I worked with people for extended periods of time, you got more and more information as they trusted you more and more. So I don't see there being that much difference between where I was there and where I am now, except that I get to work with people in a different way where I can hopefully keep them engaged and connected and, and create some shifts for children in their lives because it's about supporting parents to be the best parents that they can be so they can hold their children and provide emotional scaffolding. So I see kind of a parallel process in trying to prevent this end game but also kind of realising that I find this profoundly impactful and meaningful to me. It matters to me. Um, and, and I love it. Yeah. It's been 20 years and I still love it. You know, that hasn't abated. I think the interesting thing, Jodi, is what we have to explore during the symposium. And right now also, and as we go along, two words, of course, you said energy. That energy aspect needs to be explored because I've always been saying that the energy that a mediator brings in and the energy in that space, there is lots there which... Maybe it can't be explained or maybe it has been, I don't know. I mean, because I'm not the theory kind of person. So I would not know. Maybe if you can, if you read something, studied that, maybe you can tell us. So that energy part, the next word I will come to after that. Because the energy part of it, you want to elaborate on that and how well, you look at it? In terms of the energy, you know, I don't see conflict as good or bad. I just see conflict as people, there's, there is this sense of there's something that has to change. And the energy might be people's emotionality. It might be what they're bringing, or it actually might be what we're seeing in terms of how they're presenting. Generally, there is, you know, if there is an issue that is unresolved, then people have this emotionality or this presentation around that, that that is either a positive or a negative energy. And for me, it's about harnessing that, supporting people to harness, to create, actually create a shift for the better for them moving forward. So, so the energy, I guess, for some is a light in their lives, but for others, it's just something doesn't feel quite right or it's we need to support them to identify the commonalities in their lives 
to enable them to have a different kind of conversation. So the energy is what I see, but it, it might be totally different from where they want to be. It's just about generating a conversation. And the energy might be this is the argument, but generally it's often about something else entirely. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Does, please, does please, that please. make sense? Yeah, yeah because, because what I'm really trying to get through this symposium and the heart, soul, spirituality aspect is that a mediator connected to these aspects brings a certain energy and then connecting parties to that, does that change the energy? Does that change the way it goes? So that's, I mean, the, I'm not trying to take it in a certain direction. I'm just putting out no, these no, thoughts, well, thoughts, think, just thoughts out there. I, th I think we use a lot of strategies to support people to, you know, reformulate the energy into something that is affirming and positive. So something that is going to help them illuminate where their commonalities sit help them identify where their points of difference lie, help them to make some decisions about those points of difference, maybe medium term, short term, long term, and help them to identify, well, these are the things we can agree on. These are the things we can't agree on. How are we going to manage the things that we can't agree on? So that negative conflict isn't impacting us because one of the worst things you can do particularly to children, is expose them to ongoing unresolved conflict because that generates fighting and negativity. So that can also have a ripple effect on adults. It's not good for them to be caught in that space. So it's about harnessing that and creating it into something that can work better for people, whether it's helping them change their language, helping them think about it in a different way, helping them to communicate in a way that is affirming and positive rather than something that is might be experienced as disrespectful but also helping them choose the words intentionally and the language intentionally so they can actually the their meaning can be better understood because when people are not in that space then they're actually not helping each other to hear their interests being their wants needs concerns and fears they're just reacting to each other it's about moving them from reactivity to actually intentional action so the energy shifts from reaction to how can we be proactive how can we be working together you know rather than against each other working together to try and create that move, movement forward. So, so I guess as the mediator, we're using certain interventions. Some of that is around reframing and language. Some of it is identifying what's actually going on for people. Some of it is using, like you say, our own agency. I think being present and, and bearing witness can actually create huge power in the room. But there, it requires, like you're identifying, a mindfulness. So what is it that I'm bringing? How am I presenting? How can I support this? How can I demonstrate um, constructive communication? How can I demonstrate or model behaviours that would support this family to actually manage what's going on here and go forward with this? But, but in terms of, of course, we should have actually started with that. In terms of heart, soul, spirituality, what do they really mean for you? I mean, in... um, well, I, guess, I guess my heart is what I bring into the session and my inherent value of people um, and, and my desire to want to bring the skill sets that I have um, and there's a desire that I have to actually support people to, you know, make their own choices to make their lives better. The spirituality I see is, you know, I often, on a very crude basis, a lot of clients say to me, well, what's your belief system? You know, where do you come from? And there's that over-identification over with you, you have the same belief system that I have. And I'm very cagey with clients about, well, what is my belief system? What is my background? Because a lot of it is why do you need to know that? What's important to you that I understand about you? 
what do I need to get in order to support you to make decisions going forward? So if I'm looking at my mind, my heart, my spirituality, it's an inherent belief in the goodness of people and a keenness to actually support them, that unconditional positive regard for them. And there's a sense that I can actually support them and contribute and walk with them to support that to happen. Not always, because sometimes people aren't ready for that. Sometimes it's, I'm not the right person to, to walk with them on that journey. But it's that inherent sense of, I've, I value people. Um, and, and they're important. And we need to, you know, the most important people underneath this are children. And we need to support them to be the best parents that they can be. So we're supporting the next generation. And we're minimising the trauma that they might be experiencing. Because it's not lost on me that family separation is actually a traumatic, can be a traumatic event and a traumatic experience for the next generation. So it's important in terms of what I see as, um, you know, mind, heart and spirituality to try and support minimising the harm that can occur and the fallout that can occur from that. But do you want to go backwards in time and somewhere about your growing up and that connecting to the kind of person you are and bringing the heart into the into the process? Is there something that you want to connect with that? Um, look, I, I, I think back over my life and and what what I I have always been profoundly interested in talking to people and with people. I remember as a child, I was always the one getting told off in school because I was always the one talking to people. I was always the one who, um, if I saw people being bullied, I was the one who stood up to people much bigger than me and, you know, chin up saying, well, you know, if you want to pick up, pick on someone your own size, pick on me. And it was, and I was often much smaller because I was tiny but it's this incredible sense of responsibility and I think this was the value system that was um, passed on to me we have a responsibility for and to each other and we need to step up it's not the other person's responsibility it's mine I need to step up because I can. And if we all step up and we all demonstrate that, then I think the world is going to be a better place. And I don't think you can say, well, it's somebody else's job or it's, I learned that as a young child. My mother really reinforced that message that I can and I should. And that is my, you know, responsibility because I can do it. And, and I never question that or challenge that. And I'm not suggesting that I take responsibility for other people's lives. Please, please don't hear it as Pollyanna. What I'm saying is we have a responsibility to do the best that we can do to support each other and to be there and to bear witness and to, if we see harm, to actually stand up and say that's not okay. If we see family violence to say, no, that's not all right. We need to rebalance this. We need to reset this. If we see harm out there in the world and we know there's some terrible things going on out there, the kind of buck stops and starts with us. And, and I think we need to stand up. Um, and that's kind of something that I learned very, very young and something that I've done very, very young. Um, and I find people endlessly fascinating. And I have, I've, I haven't struggled with conflict. I haven't struggled with communication. I found it easy. I don't find that it's, it's something that's difficult because it feels so natural and so comfortable. And I would have learned those skills that, you know, from my mother who was incredibly able to connect with people um, and, you know, I was able to see from a very early age her, the impact of her valuing how people felt when, the, when they were valued um, and, and how that, in, you know, how that made them feel and then how they then behaved. Um, and it was an incredible, powerful lesson to learn. So, so I'd like to say that I have changed over time and grown. 
Vikram, I don't, I don't think I have. I think I've evolved more into being the person that I am. And I've been very lucky to find ways of um, working and operationalising the things that matter the most to me. But I think sometimes people grow into the person they're, that they're supposed to be. I feel I was always that person. Um, I, I was a young, I was an old soul in a young body from a very young age. So <laughs> I, I don't know, I kind of feel people are kind of catching up now. My peers are now catching up. When, when I was younger, they all used to tell me, oh, you're so passionate about everything. And, you know, you're fighting for every cause. And, you know, and, and now they're getting there. And I'm like, yeah, see, see, <laughs> you got there. But Jody, what you just said is really, really important. I'll tell you why. Of course, for one, I've been saying that mediators are not made in 40-hour factories. There's lots that goes into it. And what you've just brought out is exactly what I've been saying. That, that series that I've got, that evolution of a mediator, this was the thought behind that. That let's go into the person, not just the parents, into the oh. grandparents. What value system did they, they, they had? Then what did they pass on to their parents? To, this person's parents and then further on and circumstances, experiences, everything. This is all so important. And of course, heart, soul, spirituality, another part of it. So that's the, exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about, that what you saw and what your mother brought for you and what you picked up from there. And I'm still saying there was a seed in you. It's not that you just, everyone, if you had a sibling, I don't know of course your, about your sibling, but if they, would they have picked up the same thing? Maybe not. So if is, everyone doesn't pick up the same thing, why? I mean, those are the things that, are, like I said, we'll be discussing. Well, the, it's, it's the nature-nurture argument that keeps moving back and forth. Sometimes people support, well, it's all nature. Other times say it's just nurture. I think it's, it's both, you know. It's, it's you're informed by your experiences. You're informed by the things that you pick up. It's very interesting what you are innately attuned to versus what you're not um, all of my siblings work as service professionals we all serve the community that's that's what we all find powerful that was a message that we received um, from our parents and from their parents you know I, I like many people carry intergenerational trauma um, and, you know, that's probably informed us in terms of taking responsibility and if you can support other people, you do. And, you, you know, you support people who can't fight for themselves and, you, you know, there's that f fabulous um, poem and I'm, I'm afraid it's lost on me now. But, you know, first of all, you've got the Mayor Angelou story about, you know, the, the agony of an untold story within you, which I think is just so powerful. But there's also that, that poem around, you know, who will stand up for me? If I don't stand up for others, then at the end of this, there'll be nobody to stand up for me. Um, and, and, you know, those lessons, you're right, it's a ripple impact and it does resonate but it's also about what's meaningful and and chicken or the egg what comes first exactly so those are those are interesting and important discussions jody i think this is really but what about if you go backwards and you go to your grandparents i mean how, how would you look at that being an influence and their value systems being something um, that you're connected with I look I, I would i you know my my grandfathers died when i was young the message that I got from my grandfathers was, you know, one was very much about working for the family and dedicated his life for his family. The other one was very much you dedicate your life for your community, but you do it quietly. So you don't trumpet your own accomplishments. You don't, you know, look at me, look at what I've done. It's all very anonymous and quiet. You just do it. Um, and that was a message that was very strong. My grandmothers were both very strong characters who, who um, also saw family and community, community, however you define it, as being really important. And, you know, education was really important. Standing up was very important. Being there for people was very important. So, so whether my parents learned this 
and then passed it on to me or I observed it. The other thing was that hard work is something that you, you aspire to. It's to be valued. You know, you, you contribute. You contribute in a meaningful way and you contribute in a way that you can contribute. So, so part of this was, and I think this was not necessarily from my family, but from what I observed, is that people need to contribute in a way that they can. So what I notice is there are certain um, professions in our world that are highly valued and ridiculously paid. And there are other professions like childcare and teachers and nurses and, and cleaners in hospitals who are the backbone of our world, who, who are totally undervalued and, and totally dismissed. And, and I learned very early on that everybody has equal value and that you treat everybody the same because you do, you know, you just do. So it doesn't matter what role somebody has in life or where they sit, you don't know why they're at where they're at. And it's this unconditional positive regard for everyone and treating everybody the same way. The very important thoughts, Jodi. I mean, maybe you just take it for granted because they're just there in you, but these are really important and everyone doesn't think the same way. But can we put mediators in the same list of people who are not valued? <laughs> I, I, would, I would say the people who value mediators are the ones who, who get the benefit of the service. But I don't think we're paid commensurate to what we bring. Um, and, but I think that's also part of not trumpeting what we're bringing and people actually not even being alert to what we're introducing and how we're kind of trying to teach them. You know, we're trying to be explicit and transparent, but some of the skills that they're picking up may not be so clear to them. Um, you know, kind of a job well done is a job where people didn't even realise what you were doing. Um, but yes, I would absolutely agree with you that I think we that really good mediators are really undervalued and the mediators that are often valued are kind of, dare I say it, ex-judges who have the high prestige and they just literally bang heads together for outcomes and people are willing to pay ridiculous sums of money and they feel they get value from that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I think maybe the values that a mediator brings, I think those values, do you think society itself has stopped valuing? Um, I see the clients in my room and if they're indicative of society, then I, I think they value what I bring. I see my referral base, they value what I bring. Um, I see my students, the, the people that I teach, they value what I bring. I think people can be complacent and not realise. And once they start to kind of get a sense of the layers and the, you know, it, it's multifaceted and it's not just a simple, okay, you talk now, you talk, okay, done. You know, once they begin to understand what you're actually doing and how you're doing it, I think the complexities and the nuances become appreciated. But I don't think people... Um, kind of any more than they would understand what a, you know, a neurosurgeon is doing. You know, they don't know. They don't know what we're doing. And I sadly think that there's some practice that, 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 that is not as good as it should be. Um, there are people who do not make use of supervision or reflective practice in the way that they need to, um, and they don't challenge their practice. There are a lot of people who do. Um, but, I, you know, you talk about mediation. I don't think supervision is valued as much as it should be. You know, you, you have Michael Lang speaking. He's an extraordinary gift to our community around understanding reflective practice and supervision. I don't think enough people use it as well as they should. But have you seen the episodes with him? My episodes I've, with him. I have seen a lot of um, presentations with Michael Lang and I've presented with him on a number of occasions. He is, like I said, he is a gift, incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly generous with, with his, his knowledge, sharing it with, you know, the community and the world at large. Okay. 
So this answer to my question is no, I haven't seen your shows. No, That's I the haven't answer. seen all. <laughs> exactly. No, but, but Vikram, I haven't seen all of them. No, I haven't. No, there are too many. There are too many, too many to watch. But I'm saying the one with Michael, of course, were interesting because he had a group of his a practice group from Ireland. He had those mm. people there, so that was also interesting. The way what they do in their practice group. Yes, I I have done a reflective debrief. Um, example with him um, that I don't think you've seen either, um, where we we've 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 presented a number of webinars, a couple of webinars together, talking about reflective practice and supervision, um, and we've also demonstrated reflective debriefing, um, and you know he truly is skillful, incredibly skillful in. In, in demonstrating what good practice looks like and what good reflection looks like. So but, I look forward to seeing that. I haven't seen it yet. No, but the I... one that you, you said that you do you did, when was that with him? I've uh, done a couple of sessions with him for an organisation called Resolution Institute mm -hmm. and one in Australia. And I've also done for, we had a national mediation conference in Australia. I think it was last September and we did a session together there too. Because um, what, what, and we've got another one coming up and a couple of other kind of ones in the wind. Because what Michael said was that the one what he did with the practice group from Ireland was the first time any that, that what his sessions were recorded and they were out on YouTube. So I'm happy about that. And that's what I've been saying, that this hasn't happened earlier with Michael. So that's the first time. <laughs> I don't know that it's on YouTube, though. So you might be right about that. Yeah. Okay. So, but the only, I think the, from what you were just saying, I think mediation is going to be one of those blind men in the elephant kind of situations. So there will be certain things that people will experience in relation to mediation, and that is what they will take forward. So there is a certain kind of mediation, which I would think is what for me is important and that is where the heart soul spirituality fits in but maybe that's not the way it is practiced or maybe some people don't even need that so i think there'll be various aspects which will come up yeah i look at there you know in australia uh, lawrence bull talks about different models of mediation practice you know the facilitative the therapeutic the settlement the directive you know like a whole range of different processes and for me, you know, I'm very clear that I use an eclectic model of I facilitate sessions, but it's also a therapeutic, transformative lens. Um, but there are other people who do a purely settlement directive model um, or they do the MedArb model, which is mediation. And then if that doesn't resolve, then looking at kind of moving into an arbitration model. So there, there are lots of different processes and I think you're right different horses for different courses you know and and I think different mediators are better and worse placed for clients for specific clients um, I think though you know my referral base are usually you know counsellors and and lawyers who know that I will really work to create a shift for families to support them to better communicate and work together to support their children, um, which is, a you know, that model around kind of transforming but also enabling them to develop the skills to resolve any issues that might develop along the track. Well, the other word that I was, when I was saying that energy is one word, the other word obviously you used was trust. So where does trust and how does the heart, soul, spirituality aspect of a mediator and connecting to the same elements of the parties and does trust come from there where does trust come from so a little bit about trust okay well if, if i'm looking at a trauma-informed practice um, underpinning trauma-informed practice is safety and trustworthiness now i'm very clear that the person who needs to consider me trustworthy is the client in the room and, you know, the way I try and describe it to my clients is if this is trust, this is coaster, um, you know, I don't give you trust. This is my trust and I trust you forever and a day. You, you develop trust by demonstrating trustworthy behaviour and the person on the receiving end has to be part of that conversation about what they consider trustworthy. So it's about engaging with them about let's, 
learn about trust. Help me to understand what you consider trustworthy because I will act transparent, I will be clear, I will be explicit, I will work with you, I will do the things that I think help develop trust. But it's also got to be a, an exchange between you and I. You know, you, you have to be part of that conversation. So I do think trust is an in, in, important inherent part of this. But I think trust is individual. And I think it's also a relationship, relational aspect to it. So I, I do think, you know, a lot of my, I think about a lot of my clients who, who actually are mediating in the absence of trust between them. But what I'm hoping is that working with them to build trust, to rebuild trust and demonstrate and get them to articulate what they need, what reassurances they need, what they need to see from the other person will support the building of trust. So I see it as not only from me to them or me showing, it's about them to me and them to each other. So it's about not creating a triangulation, but creating a relational aspect to it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But now what I'm doing is I'm going a little deeper into that and to explore the aspect of, because everything that you said is what happens. But why does it happen? I'm just trying to explore that. And we'll be discussing it as we go along in the symposium also, that you're, you're coming with your heart, you're the soul that you are, and your spirituality are these factors that parties look at as when they trust you are those the aspects that are important um, i think i think part of this and and the kind of word that that's missing from that is authentic self so so people know when you're bringing your authentic self and when you're genuine as opposed to when you're putting it on um, and I think if you're genuinely trying to understand, if you're genu genuinely present and attuned and you're trying to work with people to find out what they need, and again, Vikram, I think you're right, there are some people who don't want to work with you in this way. There are other people who would prefer a more settlement focus because they're not looking to engage or connect in this way. But in terms of the clients that I have, this is the service that I offer. And before they engage with me, I actually have a conversation with them. This is what I do. This is how I do it. You need to think about it. You need to speak to the other person. They need to contact me. They need to be clear that I'm neutral, I'm independent. This is the way I run my service. And before we even get to starting point. So in terms of being trustworthy and authentic, I think by being upfront about this is what I do and you need to opt in because I might not be the right person for you. It's a bit like, you know, if your children have a teacher and they're the best teacher in the world but they don't get your kids, they're not the best teacher in the world. You know, it's about am I the right person for you right now and that's a choice that they need to be actively making as well. Well, I think because what we, that means needs to also explore is the authentic self that you used. I think what is the authentic self of a person and what elements are part of that? I think that also, if there's something, some thought that you have on that a little more, maybe you can elaborate if you think. Um, look, I think, I, think that's a, I think that's a difficult one to, to convey because I think that's about me thinking I'm bringing my authentic, genuine self, um, but it's about the other person's perception of that. So, you know, if they think I'm putting it on, if they think I'm being fake, if they think that this is an act, if they think I'm reading a script, if, if, if I'm not responding to their cues, if I'm just focusing on what they're saying, which is, you know, 10% of communication is verbal, 90% are nonverbal cues. If I'm bringing all of that to the table, then it's far more likely that they accept that I am actually genuinely interested. But there's a requirement, I guess, in that to be consistent. So if you're kind of screaming at someone in the background and then turning it on, you know, that's not authentic. That, you know, it's like, well, who is the real, who is the real Jody? Um, you know, we're multifaceted, yes, 
but I think it's a, a you know about being consistent, stepping up, and and being open to the questions that clients might have of you, um, and and kind of contracting with them. You know, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it, and sticking to that. Because I think why I'm saying well, I want to explore the authentic self aspect is because I'm of course the topic for me is heart soul spirituality and I'm trying to see that when we say authentic self what are those aspects of us which come out as authentic self or what should come out and do they come out I mean when you're coming from the heart like you said does the other person really feel that you're coming from the heart or how does that work and then yeah and and, and I think that's the actual million dollar question. The person who's got to decide whether I'm being authentic is the person who's hearing me. Yep. Um, and, and it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter. And, and in effect, if I'm trying to convince them, see, for me, there's also that phrase around explain, don't defend. As soon as you shift into the I'm defending, no, I'm, I'm trying to explain where I'm coming from and, and it's your call whether I'm authentic. It's your call whether I'm going to be the right person to support you in managing this. It's your call whether you kind of think that I might be able to bear witness and, you know, but again, I've got to tell you that in all the years I've been doing this, I've only had one person who's ever said, well, you know, I wanted to see a male and you're not a male. And I said, well, okay, well, let's talk about the process and then I'll refer you to a male, but you're here. And at the end of it, they said, well, I want to see you. And I said, but I'm not a male. And they said, I don't care about that anymore. And I said, well, but you might. <laughs> and you did. And where's that shifted to? So, so I guess what I'm saying is you can only kind of be as transparent as you can be. That requires a level of insight. That requires self-reflection, trying to identify your biases trying to be open to implicit biases that you may not be alert to, but accepting that they might be there and, and giving people permission, I guess, to, 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 to name that and to be there and to kind of give you a chance to, to think about that, not to defend, but to, okay, I'm open to that. Because I'm just thinking that if that authentic self is something that comes from your heart, soul and spirituality and the soul that you are, I'm not saying comes from the soul, it's the, it's the soul that you are. Mm. And when it when that authentic self has those elements in it, by itself, I think they would be gauged as what you are. I mean, you there is no concept of a difference in, in perceiving you, I would think. Because if those, it's like a pure aspect of you and that pure aspect is something which is, is there a common universal pure self which everyone can connect to? And Vikram, I think you're saying it. <laughs> I am the way I am, no matter where I am, um, no matter who I'm speaking to, no matter what forum I'm presenting on. I'm genuinely interested in people. Um, I want to work with them. Um, I want to support them in managing their conflicts. And I'm absolutely curious and incredibly grateful that they're willing to, to, to let me into the portion of their lives that they're willing to let me into. And it's not lost on me that nobody, when they start a relationship, wants to meet up with someone like me, you know. Welcome to your relationship. Now come and meet a mediator. You know, we're not meeting them at the best times of their lives. And, you know, I, I try and be very open and, and forgiving um, and let them know that I'm, I'm not carrying judgment because I'm not. I have no right to judge. And I hope, I hope that comes through. But, again, you know, that's really up to the receiver to see and the receiver to decide. But I'm, that just, yeah, but yeah. I'm, just, I'm thinking the receiver will see. If all those elements that I'm saying are part of you, I think the receiver will see and it will come across in the process. I mean, I'm just, like I said, I would not want to conclude. We just started off the symposium. So I don't want to conclude. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but I still feel, yeah, we need to uh, maybe explore these or maybe at some stage, of course, conclude them. <laughs> so I, I think, I think that, but they're, 
they're the questions, the questions around trust, the questions around authentic self, questions about what do you as a person intrinsically bring to your work? What is nature? What is nurture? What is, what is it that your value system is informing you in how you do your work? Did the chicken come first or did the egg come first? You know, why is it that you do what you do and why do you find it meaningful? You know, I think they're kind of big questions that, that I almost don't want to tie up because I think to tie them up means that there's an assumption that they're finite. And it's a bit like, you know, that notion of competence. Competence assumes that you'll attain mastery. For me, I want to be developing mediation as an art form developing the artistry of the mediator because it is a constant evolving emerging practice as I hope I am a constant evolving emerging person um, transcending moving forward growing developing um, changing I, I, I don't want to be static and finite and finished and complete so those questions I kind of I, I would prefer there not to be a finished, you know, let's tie this up because I think people have their own versions of it. But, that, but that's where, again, that series is called Evolution of a Mediator because the process goes on. And this Mediation Vision 2026 I put out, the byline is Evolution of Mediators and Mediation. So definitely it'll be an evol evolving process. And Brilliant. of course, I th after this, I'm going to ask you that, do you know Anything about what I'm doing, <laughs> that's going to be. <laughs> I don't know enough about what okay. you're doing. You've just said it. You've oh. just said it because I'm now going to take you through it. Although you've seen the other sessions and you, I'm sure you've seen this part, but I'm still going to take it because obviously it's I, an opportunity. <laughs> I want to, I want to maximize the opportunity. So Vikram, please be my guest. Okay. So basically... I, okay, right now it's only April because there are other series which I do which are not happening in April because of the symposium. So maybe I won't be able to take you through that, but at least I can take you through what's happening in April. This one, uh, this was basically, I just put it out only because we were just talking about it with Prerna. So this aspect of the soul and uh, this aspect comes, I mean, the thought of the symposium comes from this also. That if mm -hmm. there is light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. If there's beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the house. If there's harmony in the house, there will be order in the nation. If there's order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. So this aspect of this, the, I mean, starting with the soul, that it's it all starts with the soul. I think that part of it is for me important, and it will come up in discussions as we go along. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying we're going to conclude. I'm not saying we're going to conclude. But I feel that we are going to be able to at least discuss these elements from a, I mean, again, broad perspective. I'm not saying that there is, we have to, like mm -hmm. I said, conclusion is not our, our, what we have to do. But I think these are conversations which did not happen. I mean, that's the way I looked at it. I don't know whether you looked at it from your I don't know, trainings, which I don't call, I don't like to use those that terminology as skill development is what I do. But have you ever discussed these elements as part of? In terms of what does a... What, from from what, the mediator's what, perspective, from the, media, from the mediation process perspective. I, a lot of the training that I do and have done um, training as in my own personal training but training that I've done has also been about uh, people appreciating what they're bringing um, and the impact of um, their own you know the personal within the professional and and what that can do in terms of how they practice so slightly different framework and and kind of language I guess mm -hmm. but certainly looking at um, you know where you're starting from and how that can have an impact um, and recognizing i mean you're calling it light i call it unconditional positive regard okay because that's, that part of it i keep saying that i'm discussing it or has it be, how much have people discussed it as part of the process i don't know so anyway let me take you through the other parts yes Mm -hmm. 
Am I connected to this? Yeah, I am connected. Ah, that's very cool. <laughs> okay, so of course, mm -hmm. come on. What's that saying about a boiling kettle? Watched boiling kettle. <laughs> Watch kettle never boils. <laughs> <laughs> no, but why? I'm just thinking that. Okay, this is that series in conversation yes. with beautiful mind. You've already so this is personal so Kazakhstan. Yes. This is the one I just showed you. This Diwali thing. So this is right now the speakers. Yes. For the symposium, which is going to of course keep changing, and the, tomorrow is the mm, keynote speech by Ken. So please Fantastic. drop in. Please drop in. Then, I might have to drop in afterwards because um I'm on a different time zone to you. I know, so. I know, I know, I know that that definitely. But I can all, watch all, afterwards. Yeah. There's always a problem, and I've always told Ken this that the time he gives is obviously very late in Australia. So because of that, a lot of people miss out on it. But for him, his morning meditation is important. So don't want him to miss out on his mindfulness. We need yeah. to be centered to practice better. Yeah. So Anna is from Ukraine. She's of course right now in Spain. Good. And then I'm glad this, she's safe. So this is a discussion on creativity, innovation, and mediation, which happens mm -hmm. on 21st April, coinciding with the World Creativity and Innovation Day. Brilliant. So if there's anything that in the aspect of creativity and innovation and mediation that you want to discuss, you can always, these posters, people can always be added to. So if you want to be part of the discussion, again, time is going to be a factor because it's 7.30 India time. Mm, Bit of an mm. issue for you, but so, okay. These are the speakers which have gone. Mm. I don't know whether you've been able to, work. you said you haven't been able to see the earlier ones. So this was Stefan on the 7th of April, Prerna right now. Of yes. course, Elena has gone. Yes. Like I keep saying, this person we've never been able to, we haven't been able to get to know, we'll get to know her <laughs> at some stage. Lisa comes in at 7.30, Kathy at 8.30. Tomorrow morning, there's Sarah. I'm sure you know Sarah. So, um, hang on, sorry, Sarah. Blake. I've, I've heard of her, but I don't know her personally. Okay, so, so she's there. With, you can always drop in if you want. I, so, I will try, but I'll, I'll say that I've got a few commitments on and so if I don't, I might have to look at it afterwards. So I'm very happy that you post it so we can. Yeah. Okay. So then we have Gabriela. Yes, tomorrow, 6 o'clock. Yes. Federico at 7 o'clock. Then, then 9.30. Ken, that's yep. how it is. Brilliant. So that's what other other series, other things of the series. I mean, other shows that I do. Uh, I mean, I don't want to take you through that, but there are lots of things which happen. So I'm going to spend a bit of time going through all the different options. To be honest, I've been um, very busy um, in Australia. We've just come out of lockdown, and so all of our services are manically busy because um, a lot of people have um, separated but been living under the one roof and now they're moving out and so there's a lot of conflict. That's sad. Okay, so basically to stay in touch with what's happening, yes. you can always, I mean, the posts that I put out, how many of them can really reach you? I don't know because that's the algorithm of the social media. They, they will show you what they want to show you. But now what the thing is, what LinkedIn has is there is a bell icon on the profile. I know the bell. I use the bell. Yes. Yeah. So the bell's that's fabulous. Way. Yeah. So yeah. that's one way, at least that's one way of getting to know what's happening because definitely those posts do go out. And otherwise, anything else that you, I don't know. I mean, you can go to my website and see that Mediation Vision 2026. See the yes. points there for discussion. If there's anything that you want to discuss there, so we can always discuss that. And of course, your concluding remarks, please. What how? Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you again because I think this is a wonderful opportunity and and peace building and building our mediator community, which is in, incredibly invaluable and a really lovely service. Um, and I want to thank you for, for being so committed to the community because 
you know, we can't do without people like you. And we were talking about mediators feeling valued and, you know, I think acknowledgement is often um, understated and undervalued. So I really want to see you and say thank you for that. In, in terms of my concluding remarks, I, I think, you know, this kind of, this notion of heart, soul and spirituality is incredibly important in our work because I think we need to bring our whole being into mediating people's disputes. And, you know, it's interesting that you said Ken is doing his kind of mediation um, meditation session first thing in the morning because being physically present and bringing into line our physicality and our spirituality and nourishing all of those things means that we're far better placed to be able to do what we do. Um, and, you know, you've introduced some really interesting questions around um, authentic self and trust and building peace and, you know, what, who are you and why do you do what you do and why is it important to you? Um, and what has informed you or led you to be where you are? Um, and I think all of those questions actually do impact what we do and how we do it. So um, thank you for introducing them to me and, and getting me to question that and being interested in, in my little part of the story. So I want to thank you. So thank you, Jodi. Thank you for taking our time and being with us and definitely conversations will go on. We'll have more interesting conversations and maybe we'll explore these topics as we go along because obviously we have to evolve. Mediation has to evolve. So we'll do all Well, that. it will. How fantastic <laughs> is that? Yes. So let me Thank just... You.